Hey everyone, my name is Megan and welcome back to What's Your Why. Today's episode is going to be taken over by the powerful and the passionate John Connors, who's such a phenomenal person. He's an actor and a filmmaker who's faced so many different obstacles in his life. And in this episode, he just goes into depth a little bit about a few of those, like his experiences being bullied, what it's been like losing his dad through suicide. He lets us in on what it's been like navigating his way through different traumas that he's been faced with. John also talks about his journey prioritizing his mental health needs, as well as speaking up for what's most important to him in life. Like creativity and speaking up for traveller rights. This conversation is one that I've learned so much from and it's one I'll never forget and I hope you all get as much from it as I did. And if you've been triggered by absolutely anything in this video, know that there's a support highlight over on my Instagram that you can get any relevant support that you might need. Sit back, relax and enjoy and I'll let John take over. My name is John Connors and I'm an actor, filmmaker and activist. First of all, what I'd like to say, fair play to you for doing this and for setting this up for your mother, um, that is a horrific loss to lose your mother. I lost my father very young, so I know what that's like. I've lost a lot of people actually, um, a lot of people I loved. What impact did your dad die and have on your life? Massive, massive in that it left a big gap coming from a traditional traveler family. Like, I mean, I'm, I wasn't reared like, you know, in a house of traveler heritage. I'm the real deal. I was born and reared in a camp, you know, 52 first cousins around me living and me in the same, and it was beautiful. But not having the father there was a big thing because we were then perceived as, you know, boys who would never really become true men because we didn't have a father to show us the way. Myself and my brother Joe would have been bullied a lot uh, from traveler kids our age and older um, and, and, and bullied specifically because we had no father and even more specifically because he committed suicide. Big stigma. And then we would have got a lot of bullying in school from settled kids from just being a traveller, pikey, knacker, all this kind of stuff, even from teachers. So we would have experienced a lot of bullying, me and Joe, you know? And um, that forced me to join a boxing club, literally just to fight back, you know? And uh, I figured that I was actually a nacho and I did really well and won a lot of titles. Uh, and figured that was the dream, you know? But um, but unresolved trauma comes to collect, you know? And I didn't resolve all the trauma from my childhood. In fact, I ignored it. And this newfound self-esteem I found from boxing, I thought was the answer. Yeah. But then when I hit like 18, 19, and then 20, uh, it all came crashing down and all the trauma started to show itself in destructive behaviors. Yeah. And then I just decided to kill myself, take myself out of the pain, you know? And the pain just went so bad. I said, I have to put myself out of this misery. And then my brother Joe came into me, literally knocked on my door as I decided to kill myself. So that's why I believe in serendipity. You know, I think the world and the universe are works in a mysterious way. I really do. Because um, a lot of freaky things have happened to me in my life that can't be explained by anything other than that. So he came in and asked me, um, are you going to kill yourself? Which was just mad, considering I just decided that it would in my head. And then he, uh, I gave an indication that it was, but I said no, but because I, I didn't want to talk. You didn't want to live anymore. Like, what got you to that point? Every day was just painful, to be honest, for a very long time. For, oh, Jesus, a year and a half, nearly two years. Every day was just painful. And I completely went recluse up to my little box room in Nardale, Uh Stopped hanging around with all my friends, my family. You couldn't get a smile out of me. You know, the only time I left was to go and collect me doll, left the room to collect me doll, and then to go to the cinema. Yeah. That was it. It was getting worse and worse, and it was gaining weight rapidly. I used to get very bad panic attacks, like really vicious panic attacks. And no matter how many times you have a panic attack, I'm sure you know this, Megan, um, you still think it's a heart attack. Yeah, you think you're every dying. Time. Yeah, every single time. Because it's, it's impending doom. I have more weapons in my arsenal to fight back. We're good at talking about talking about mental health, but we're still not there of really talking about it. So we have to create our own little culture among our own little circle. And then that will have a ripple effect in the bigger culture. Yeah, when you decided that you didn't want to live anymore, what was it like for you when your brother kind of put his hand out? It was really heartwarming to be honest. Like um, myself and my brother and my other brother, we are as close as brothers can be. And me and him would be closer to the other little brother in a different way. We're sort of father figures and we, we kind of look at him 
almost like a son as well, you know. So that's a different type of closeness. Me and Joe kind of went through all the battles together. So when he reached out to me, it was really beautiful, actually, really heartwarming. Um, and my brother Joe is a very open-minded fella and highly, highly intelligent. And uh, I respect everything he says, you know. I knew he was not going to let me out of that room until I made some sort of commitment. It was an amazing load off my whole body. I felt like I could breathe again, which was very hard. It was very hard just to breathe. Just to fucking breathe was painful. It was life-changing, literally, like life-saving. That's like no doubt, it saved my life. One conversation can save your life and change your life for the absolute better. Because that conversation got me into acting, a world that thought that I was never going to be involved in and become a creative, which I always was, I didn't realize it. I'm 10 years, 11 years into my career now. I mean, I, I'm very happy with where I'm at. Yeah. what I've done as an artist, what I've written, what I've acted in my stage career, television career, film career. I don't know how it all happened, yeah. but it all started with that conversation in the room, which um, is fucking mental. You were in such a painful place. Like at what point did it turn to creativity? Well, Joe just kept talking to me and, and, and just kind of wouldn't let me off the hook. I want to know what's going on with you. Tell me what's going on. He naturally brought the conversation to a place about the future. So I was obsessed with film from a young age yeah. and have a really good knowledge of film. Like I'm that nerdy friend that if you want to ask me a question, I'm kind of a Google, I'm kind of Google for film. He said, why don't you try it? So then that's what happened. I, I said, yeah, why not actually? Why not try acting? And uh, it, it fucking, it set me down in a completely different road. I, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful just to be alive. Uh, it's a privilege to be alive. What do you think your dad would be proudest of you for? <sighs> That's a good one. Um, yeah, I think, I think between the, the acting and I think also speaking up for travellers would have been a big one for him. I've done it sort of unapologetically yeah. to the detriment of my own career massively. And what a lot of my own family have criticized me and asked me not to do it out of the out of just you know thinking of me because they wanted me to do better and and that but i think he would have appreciated it he was that type of person he would have appreciated the kind of no nonsense unapologetical kind of traveler stuff so i think he would have liked that but i think the acting stuff would have given him a real uh, real buzz because he was a film buff himself you know is that who you got your love for film off yeah he introduced me to all the early films that I still love, like Scorsese stuff and all that stuff. Before it was eighth, he brought me to my first film ever, was Space Jam, in 1996. Right. Uh, yeah, so I can remember that very well. Like it's kind of uh, me and his kind of passions are are intrinsically attached. Like where the passion or love started from me or where it ended for him, who knows? You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything you're doing, there's a little bit of him in it as well, which is really beautiful. Um, yeah, it is absolutely. Yeah, and when you're speaking about like how you represent the traveling community, what's it been like growing up as a, a traveler? The different Ireland going on for us is that everywhere we go, we get haze. It's the way it is now today. Like growing up, we couldn't get into shops. We couldn't, you know, pubs, clubs, restaurants, gyms, hotels, your local shops. In school, your teachers calling you knacker, pikey. We were segregated, put in all travel classes. And that was daily. That was daily. And I mean, the only the only thing you can take from it is that you're hated. And what happens is you internalize that hate yourself. Yeah. You begin to hate yourself unconsciously. You begin to be ashamed of your identity unconsciously. On the surface, you say you're proud. So what it does is it messes with your identity at the deepest level. Hence the suicide rate amongst travelers. Uh, that's a big reason why, is the state policies and assimilation policies against us. Um, we have the highest suicide rate per capita of any people in the world. 11% of travelers die by suicide. It's our number one killer. That's just the way we grew up and it became normality. Like, But a lot of travelers adopt a victim or the fetus mentality. You don't have hope anymore. It's a sad thing to see because when you remove hope, that's when bad things happen. Most of them get broken down by their teens and go, <laughs> we've no chance. So they internalize all that stuff. And that's really catastrophic for an individual. Just the Ireland I went through, and it definitely left its psychological scars on me. I've been out there in the front lines fighting for my people since day one. I've tried to do as much as I could fucking humanly could. 
Yeah. And I'm always there to fight for me people and to fight for anybody, anybody, any human being needs help without a doubt. But then sometimes you need to take a break and switch off and all that and uh, look after yourself. Of course. You should be no good than nobody else, you know what I mean? Literally could listen to you speaking all day. Um, what do people get wrong about travellers? The list is endless. Discrimination is a learned behaviour. Racism is a learned behaviour. Yeah. Um, and it's an this is an attitude that is endemic within Irish society. And uh, it's been happening for generations. And actually came from the government from the top down. Uh, 1963, there was a report on itinerancy. They called it itinerance back then. And in his commission, his objective was, and I quote, I'm looking for the final solution to the itinerant problem. So that'll tell you the kind of attitude that came from that. And in that commission, government ministers, councillors, TDs suggested to sterilise the women, castrate the men, or put them all out in Spike Island. But what some people don't really know is that our culture is not some weird voodoo culture. It stems from Gaelic Ireland. Yeah. We actually hold on to a lot of the old traditions that settled people don't. And actually, that's what just means a lot to us. Like that, like us living in a site with loads of family around us. That's the old, ancient Tuwe clan culture of Ireland, pre-colonization. We managed to keep that alive because we kept nomadic, and nomadism was not the be on and end all of our culture. It was just one aspect that managed to protect the rest of the culture, which is just old Gaelic Irish culture. So there's a lot of misconceptions around that. And I'm first to admit there's a there's a travel element to crime, but there is whenever you systematically discriminate against the people, remove options, put them in a position of poverty, try to assimilate them and eradicate their culture and destroy their identity. Two fucking writers crime. Two fucking writers, all this stuff. Most settled people are actually unaware of all this stuff. They're unaware of our history, our culture, what we're actually trying to protect, what has happened to us and our relationship with the state, which has been a frosty one at best, you know? Just imagining the younger generation looking at you, the role model they have in you. Whenever someone says, oh, John Connor's fair play to him, he came from nothing and now he's succeeding. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. I came from everything except money, but I came from everything else everything else and i'm proud of everything that i went through i experienced my family the, what he taught me our history our culture and um and our future i know is going to be great too what are you most proud of yourself for <sighs> um look I, I the most important thing in my, in my life is just my family my mother my nieces nephews brothers all that mm -hmm. And uh, they're the most important thing. I suppose in my professional life, the proudest thing for me would have been just me documentaries on Travers, which was recognised by our, our, the Irish History magazine and uh, uh, given great credibility, the research that was involved in that. And, and we cracked some big, we cracked some big nuts on that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some big stuff that it goes down in history. Because I think they made a big impact uh, with Travers as well, you know? and would settle people who would have watched them too, I think, as well. You reference creativity a lot as well and talked about creativity. Like, what impact has that had on your life? It uh, saved me life. Changed me life. Constantly saves me life. <laughs> um, constantly centers me. Um, brings me back to my meaning. Um, creativity and the feeling and spirituality from that is the meaning for me. And then my purpose is film, acting, theater, you know? And then the passion is all of those things combined, what drives it all. And you need the meaning, the purpose, the passion. Um, so creativity is at the center of that. What's your why? I suppose what I'd like to be remembered for, um, someone who had a passion for life and just went for what they want it kind of, it's very hard to not sound like an arrogant wank cunt you know what i mean but uh, like i kind of realized that there is some lessons in my life and i've learned some really harsh lessons and um i have been on the brink um of leaving this world a number of times so i know that there, i do have knowledge that is worth something and um, because i people tell me it and i know I know when I see someone and look in their eyes, I know that he got something from it. So that's a lovely feeling. So knowing that I do have that to give, then I'm more than happy and willing and wanting to talk about the experiences, not just about me, but the experiences I've went through and how I've come the other side and what, what little tips and tricks I've learned along the way, because that is a form of kind of, for me, giving back.